Chapter 1 of The Ghost Pirates by William Hope Hodgson. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, visit LibriVox.org. The Ghost Pirates. Chapter 1 The Figure Out of the Sea. He began without any circumlocution. I joined the Mort Zestus in Frisco. I heard before I signed on that there were some funny yarns floating round about her, but I was pretty nearly on the beach and too jolly anxious to get away, to worry about trifles. Besides, by all accounts, she was right enough so far as grub and treatment went. When I asked fellows to give it a name, they generally could not. All they could tell me was that she was unlucky and made thundering long passages, and had no more than a fair share of dirty weather. Also, that she had twice had the sticks blown out of her and her cargo shifted. Besides all these, a heap of other things that might happen to any packet, and would not be comfortable to run into. Still, they were the ordinary things, and I was willing enough to risk them to get home. All the same, if I had been given the chance, I should have shipped in some other vessel as a matter of preference. When I took my bag down, I found that they had signed on the rest of the crowd. You see, the home lot cleared out when they got into Frisco. That is, all except one young fellow, a cockney, who had stuck by the ship in port. He told me afterwards, when I got to know him, that he intended to draw a payday out of her whether anyone else did or not. The first night I was in her, I found that it was common talk among the other fellows that there was something queer about the ship. They spoke of her as if it were an accepted fact that she was haunted. Yet they all treated the matter as a joke. All, that is, except the young Cockney, Williams, who, instead of laughing at their jests on the subject, seemed to take the whole matter seriously. This made me rather curious. I began to wonder whether there was, after all, some truth underlying the vague stories I had heard, and I took the first opportunity to ask him whether he had any reasons for believing that there was anything in the yarns about the ship. At first he was inclined to be a bit offish, but presently he came round and told me that he did not know of any particular incident which could be called unusual in the sense in which I meant. Yet that, at the same time, there were lots of little things, which, if you put them together, made you think a bit. For instance, she always made such long passages and had so much dirty weather. Nothing but that and calms and headwinds. Then other things happened. Sails that he knew himself had been properly stowed were always blowing adrift at night and then he said a thing that surprised me. "'There's too many bloomin' shatters about this here packet. They gets onto your nerves like nothing as ever I seen before in me natural.' He blurted it all out in a heap, and I turned round and looked at him. "'Too many shadows?' I said. "'What on earth do you mean?' But he refused to explain himself or tell me anything further just shook his head stupidly when I questioned him. He seemed to have taken a sudden, sulky fit. I felt certain that he was acting dense purposely. I believe the truth of the matter is that he was, in a way, ashamed of having let himself go like he had in speaking out his thoughts about shatters. That type of man may think things at times, but he doesn't often put them into words. Anyhow, I saw it was no use asking any further questions, so I let the matter drop there. Yet, for several days afterwards, I caught myself wondering at times what the fellow had meant by shatters. We left Frisco the next day with a fine fair wind that seemed a bit like putting the stopper on the yarns I had heard about the ship's ill luck. And yet... He hesitated a moment and then went on again. For the first couple of weeks out, nothing unusual happened, and the wind still held fair. 
I began to feel that I had been rather lucky, after all, in the packet into which I had been shunted. Most of the other fellows gave her a good name, and there was a pretty general opinion growing among the crowd that it was all a silly yarn about her being haunted. And then, just when I was settling down to things, something happened that opened my eyes no end. It was in the eight to twelve watch, and I was sitting on the steps on the starboard side, leading up to the forecastle head. The night was fine, and there was a splendid moon. Away aft, I heard the timekeeper strike four bells, and the lookout, an old fellow named Jasket, answered him. As he let the bell lanyard, he caught sight of me where I sat quietly smoking. He leant over the rail and looked down at me. That you, Jessop? he asked. I believe it is, I replied. We'd have our grandmothers and all the rest of our petticoated relations come in to see, if twere always like this, he remarked reflectively, indicating with a sweep of his pipe and hand the calmness of the sea and sky. I saw no reason for denying that, and he continued. If this old packet is haunted, as some on him seems to think, well, all as I can say is, let me have the luck to tumble across another of the same sort. Good grub and duff for Sundays, and a decent crowd of em aft, and everything comfortable like, so as you can feel your nose where you are. As for air being haunted, that's all ellish nonsense. I've come across lots of em before, as was said to be haunted, and so some one em was, but twasn't with ghostesses. One packet I was in, they was that bad you couldn't sleep a wink in your watch below until you'd add every stitch out of your bunk and add a regular unt. Sometimes. At that moment, the relief, one of the ordinary seamen, went up the other ladder onto the forecastle head, and the old chap turned to ask him why the hell he hadn't relieved him a bit smarter. The ordinary made some reply, but what it was, I did not catch. For abruptly, away aft, my rather sleepy gaze had lighted on something altogether extraordinary and outrageous. It was nothing less than the form of a man stepping inboard over the starboard rail, a little abaft the main rigging. I stood up and caught at the handrail and stared. Behind me, someone spoke. It was the lookout, who had come down off the forecastle head on his way aft to report the name of his relief to the second mate. What is it, mate? he asked, curiously seeing my intent attitude. The thing, whatever it was, had disappeared into the shadows on the lee side of the deck. Nothing, I replied shortly, for I was too bewildered then at what my eyes had just shown me to say any more. I wanted to think. The old shellback glanced at me, but only muttered something and went on his way aft. For a minute, perhaps, I stood there watching, but could see nothing. Then I walked slowly aft as far as the after end of the deck house. From there I could see most of the main deck, but nothing showed, except, of course, the moving shadows of the ropes and spars and sails as they swung to and fro in the moonlight. The old chap who had just come off the lookout had returned forward again, and I was alone on that part of the deck. And then, all at once, as I stood peering into the shadows to leeward, I remembered what Williams had said about there being too many shadows. I had been puzzled to understand his real meaning then. I had no difficulty now. There were too many shadows. Yet, shadows or no shadows, I realized that for my own peace of mind, I must settle once and for all whether the thing I had seemed to see stepping aboard out of the ocean had been a reality or simply a phantom, as you might say, of my imagination. My reason said it was nothing more than imagination, a rapid dream. I must have dozed. But something deeper than reason told me that this was not so. I put it to the test and went straight in amongst the shadows. There was nothing. I grew bolder. My common sense told me I must have fancied it all. I walked over to the mainmast and looked behind the pinrail that partly surrounded it, 
and down into the shadow of the pumps. But here again was nothing. Then I went in under the break of the poop. It was darker under there than out on deck. I looked up both sides of the deck and saw that they were bare of anything such as I looked for. The assurance was comforting. I glanced at the poop ladders and remembered that nothing could have gone up there without the second mate or the timekeeper seeing it. Then I leaped my back up against the bulk's head and thought the whole matter over rapidly, sucking at my pipe and keeping my glance about the deck. I concluded my think and I said, no, out loud. Then something occurred to me and I said, unless... It went over to the starboard bulwarks and looked over and down into the sea. But there was nothing but sea, and so I turned and made my way forward. My common sense had triumphed, and I was convinced that my imagination had been playing tricks with me. I reached the door on the port side, leading into the forecastle, and was about to enter when something made me look behind. As I did so, I had a shaker. Away aft, a dim, shadowy form stood in the wake of a swaying belt of moonlight that swept the deck a bit abaft the mainmast. It was the same figure that I had just been attributing to my fancy. I will admit that I felt more than startled. I was quite a bit frightened. I was convinced now that it was no mere imaginary thing. It was a human figure, and yet, with the flicker of the moonlight and the shadows chasing over it, I was unable to say more than that. Then, as I stood there, irresolute and funky, I got the thought that someone was acting the goat. Though, for what reason or purpose, I never stopped to consider. I was glad of any suggestion that my common sense assured me was not impossible. And for the moment, I felt quite relieved. That side to the question had not presented itself to me before. I began to pluck up courage. I accused myself of getting fanciful. Otherwise, I should have tumbled to it earlier. And then, funnily enough, in spite of all my reasoning, I was still afraid of going aft to discover who that was, standing on the lee side of the main deck. Yet, I felt that if I shirked it, I was only fit to be dumped overboard. And so I went, though not with any great speed, as you can imagine. I had gone half the distance, and still the figure remained there, motionless and silent, and the moonlight and the shadows playing over it with each roll of the ship. I think I tried to be surprised. If it were one of the fellows playing the fool, he must have heard me coming, and why didn't he scoot while he had the chance? And where could he have hidden himself before? All these things I asked myself in a rush with a queer mixture of doubt and belief. And, you know, in the meantime, I was drawing nearer. I had passed the house and was not twelve paces distant, when, abruptly, the silent figure made three quick strides to the port rail and climbed over it into the sea. I rushed to the side and stared over, but nothing met my gaze except the shadow of the ship sweeping over the moonlit sea. How long I stared down blankly into the water, it would be impossible to say. Certainly, for a good minute, I felt blank, just horribly blank. It was such a beastly confirmation of the unnaturalness of the thing I had concluded to be only a sort of brain fancy. I seemed, for that little time, deprived, you know, of the power of coherent thought. I suppose I was dazed mentally stunned in a way. As I have said, a minute or so must have gone while I had been staring into the dark of the water under the ship's side. Then I came suddenly to my ordinary self. The second mate was singing out, Lee for brace! I went to the braces like a chap in a dream. End of chapter one.